unfortunately, we are living in crazy times. And um, okay, there is already light at the end of the tunnel and uh, things will get better. Nevertheless, I think it is also um, an important time to understand the role of IT and the role of ICT particularly. So um, we have to, at least what we are currently witnessing at Fraunhofer is that uh, even due to this pandemic, we are doing very well because we see that a lot of countries around the world are now moving forward to deploy 5G networks. And um, not only that they are really commercially deploying 5G networks, which is complicated, and I will elaborate a little bit on this uh, a little bit later, but um, particularly in the research arena, um, a lot of things are currently happening and uh, we are quite proud and uh, basically very happy um, that um, our decision some years ago uh, to develop this 5G core um, was the right one because it is now used all around the world by some major tier one network operators, but also by tier one OT companies in the industrial domain. And um, this is great feedback. Uh, so obviously we did a lot of things right. Um, and we are moving on, particularly in these days where the whole world is talking about national IT sovereignty and um, open RAN, open networks and so on. So new ecosystems, which will be built up. And, um, you know, we, at Focus, basically I, 30 years ago, coined this kind of term, um, demo or die, uh, which means uh, as a researcher, it's nice to put on some PowerPoint slides. Everyone can do this, but at the very end, you need to see some software running in order to move some bits and bytes. And we are not talking about a mock-up, which is running in a lab, but we are talking about real working code where you can put in a wire shark and see what is going to happen there. And this of course creates a lot of um, recognition. And um, of course it creates a lot of know-how. And my ambition is, and I'm happy to be here part of this conference, uh, you may know that I have uh, quite close relationships to Cape Town University and um, building up a small team together with Neko Ventura and Joyce Mangava um, to, to create young, talented people. And uh, IT these days um, is important in telecommunications. And thanks to these toolkits, which are allowing um, also students to get what I call the dirty hands of hacking and understanding the software, it is very, very important. And as already said, um, of course, we, we are still in an age where network operators and particularly the key vendors and um, some Chinese, some European, some US vendors are of course sitting in the driving chairs, having the monopoly on technologies. But this is going to change. And this is particularly going to change with something which um, on the one hand is already long known as enterprise networks, because in your company, you can do whatever you want, right? Um, in terms of communications. The tricky part is when you go, of course, into licensed spectrum and you do this in a wireless way, then um, you need, of course, some regulation in order to get access to this. And this is currently changing. We see the uh, willingness of governments and uh, regulators around the world to open up some frequencies for allowing to build up local wireless test sets, campus networks. And um, this is what I want to talk in my talk today uh, to give you some insights. But nevertheless, I still want, of course, as 5G is considered to be the catalyst for this, uh, although we today still have already uh, or already have private LTE networks, uh, but I think it is based on the software nature of 5G that uh, makes the implementation of private networks probably a little bit easier. We are not yet there, so this is still a subject of research and uh, practical exploration, but my 
feeling is that in two years from now, we will see a lot of campus networks and a lot of toolkits, particularly exploiting machine learning and artificial intelligence for automated network deployment and optimization, which allow enterprises in whatever area uh, to build up their own networks and not to um, uh, rent infrastructure from network operators. Of course, this is a big debate these days. Should network operators be the ones who provide the campus networks? So it's basically they bring to you the network infrastructure and you are using this infrastructure via the slicing concept as your own network. But honestly, the technologies which are currently available from the big vendors are not ready for fulfilling the needs of these campus networks. And um, therefore there's a big opportunity for this. So, okay, you can go on to the next slide. And then basically uh, in my introduction, you have heard, I'm, I'm an old person um, in the sense that I'm working since 33 years in the field of programming telecommunication networks, which are subject of convergence. And honestly, and I love my job, I'm doing since 33 years, the same thing. So it's just different technologies which are used, you know? So it was the time when object orientation started and Java started to create uh, portable code. Nowadays we have virtualization and we can bring things back and forth on different parts of the environment or infrastructure. Um, it was all about multimedia. Then we have seen machine to machine communications changing a little bit the paradigm, but in principle, it's all about programming of the infrastructure. And indeed it is really cool um, to see how 5G basically um, makes use of, or basically is driven by the evolution of the last 10 years in ICT. And um, I, I have been engaged in a, a couple of studies for the German Ministry of Infrastructures and of course on the European Union level. And uh, it's all about this uh, digital transformation of the infrastructure. And basically it is mainly uh, 5G, which these days is considered as a unifying network architecture to drive and stimulate this digital transformation. So I will talk a little bit about this, but then I want to uh, describe to you the key 5G concepts, which are important from my point of view, and nevertheless also want to show to you the challenges we are foreseeing uh, in standardization and product availability, and exactly this brings up the chance to do things better in a smaller scale in a private network environment. And we will also understand that 5G infrastructure is not just a network. In the end, it is connectivity for applications, connecting devices, customizing the communications and the devices for doing specific things. And of course, this is where the biggest innovation is because this brings up new services for smart cities, for smart factories, for smart safety and so on. So we have to consider that um, Basically, you need in the future a very customized network infrastructure. And um, we understood that, uh, you know, I, I'm on the one hand, of course, a researcher which applies for research projects. And um, the challenge is um, how can you create sustainability? Sustainability in the sense that um, you, you do hopefully many research projects, but you are doing to some extent similar things. And to do this on the legal side, because you can't sell to your customers the same kind of research. We started very early, some probably 12 years ago, uh, to develop software toolkits as the common foundation for our research projects. And uh, this uh, common software toolkits are the foundation for students, and uh, for scientists um, in order to learn how the real world may look like or lo is looking like, because we are with our toolkits on eye to eye level. Sometimes we are looking even down to some of the vendors um, because they are all cooking with water 
and we see that there are lots of uh, big challenges, which um, at least on the software layer, we are managing quite well. And so the Open 5G core we are developing since five years, basically, is something which is very um, recognized these days. Because when I was thinking about in the 5G architecture, where should we put our focus on? It is a core network because in the core network, you have most of the challenging tasks because you have to connect to different access networks, being it legacy or the new radio 5G or even upcoming terahertz communications or satellite communications as backhauls. You need to bring in the applications from the top. So this is a very agile environment driven by IT innovation. And um, last but not least, in order to show to you um, that this is not the end, it is just a starting point for something which crazy enough already starts now, where even 5G is not really there where it should be, 6G. Yeah? So I, I'm so busy in the last weeks to file for huge 6G projects because um, the international race is on. You know that the US and China are somehow in some <laughs> conflict and uh, going forward to develop their own software ecosystems. And of course, we as Europeans are squeezed somehow in between. We are doing, of course, our own uh, stuff nowadays. Okay, at least we have Nokia and Ericsson. So we have some technology uh, stakeholders here. We have strong network operators. Nevertheless, uh, we have good research. And so I'm now starting 6G research. So this is the agenda and uh, let's rush through some of these slides. So the next one, please. So um, I think um, this slide, you know, there, there is a very nice um, white paper and you will find in the slide deck, which will be made available to you later on, uh, some key references. And um, it's not so much um, about research papers from the one or the other, because I'm, I'm doing applied research and I'm working for Fraunhofer. So we have to work with the industry. And um, here it is very important. And I think this is also important for young, talented master and PhD students to understand who in the end is paying for what we are developing. How do the business models look like? What is the value chain? And um, what is the market size? And in which parts? you should do your research. Nevertheless, um, so long story short, TM Forum has published a very nice um, report on 5G um, deployment options and technologies. And as part of this, they are also refer refer referring to a Capgemini um, uh, study on uh, what are the key pillars for the digital transformation. And besides virtualization and cloud computing on the one hand, particularly 5G, is uh, mentioned here as the enabler for the digital transformation, because it is clear that you need a connectivity plane, because we talk about devices which now need to be connected to some infrastructure to be controlled ideally remotely or to deliver some data from these devices to this kind of infrastructure. And on top of this, having AI and machine learning to do some smart things. But this is typically wireless. And the question now is which type of wireless technologies should you use? And 5G probably has the biggest momentum here because it serves a lot of these capabilities which are needed by different application domains. Next slide, please. So um, what is 5G about? And I mentioned this. So for me, you know, um, my research was on multimedia applications. Uh, when we did UMTS, so the 3G network environments, and we have seen voice over IP, video conferencing, messaging, uh, presence, location-based services. And then it was clear that this is over the top business and something new is happening for network operators, the internet of things. And then we started to develop machine to machine platforms and uh, looking into IoT application domains. Then we recognize that there is this network virtualization happening. So everything goes into the cloud. Uh, cloudification was one big thing. And then people have recognized, okay, we need some privacy and uh, things should happen locally. And particularly if we want to have some kind of real-time control, distance matters. 
and edge computing popped up as an evolution for um, this. And um, then we have seen also that um, there are, besides the big success of LTE infrastructures, which are really delivering a cool infrastructure, where all of this network virtualization has started slowly, um, that there is a need for more bandwidth, there's uh, the need to really provide capacity for all these applications on the one hand, but there's also the need for connecting factories and so on. Nevertheless, there's also rural areas who lack fiber. And then the question is, what is the role of satellite networks into this as well? So interestingly enough, in all of these areas, we did some kind of research. And um, all of a sudden, somehow 5G somehow majored, uh, taking um, the best of these technology influences and trying to bring this together. You can imagine that this is a huge task because here we are talking particularly into these different application domains um, about different ecosystems, mafia situations. You know, it's not easy to get into this uh, providing connectivity. So this is 5G uh, driven by the technology innovation. Next slide, please. So um, I, I told you, I'm doing 5G since five years implementing the 5G core. Okay, we started to think about 5G probably a little bit earlier to, because the decision was driven by let's go for 5G because at this time I have created a spin-off company for the 4G core. And uh, so I was in the need to do something else on my research. So 5G somehow started 2012, 2013, uh, maybe even before with the radio network research. Nevertheless, um, there is a plan to bring up this technology. And um, of course you need international standards and standards have standard, but standard Dice products have to be available. And it is clear that here we talk about the wireless technology where you need to set up the radio network, which has to be everywhere. And uh, so there is a time plan. And this means what we currently see is baby steps in 5G deployment because of two things. The technology, which is currently available, is just the start. The real products, which are delivering all the nice promoted 5G features, will only be available in three to four years from now. So this means when to invest into the technology, particularly as it is highly costly to build out these radio stations or these uh, antenna systems throughout the country. So this means there is a time plan that we probably in 2025 will probably see in most of the key areas and main transport routes, 5G coverage being offered. And the technology is probably then available in quantity and with lots of features. Nevertheless, there's still problems with rural areas who are probably falling behind. Next step. So, but this is just to motivate that we are here on a long journey. So this is just for backup information. There is a huge market for uh, 5G. This is always a slide which um, I'm using in order to motivate, first of all, on the left-hand side. So this is a market report from ID Tech X. And uh, you see some different applications which are um, somehow evolving over time. So in the beginning, it is just fixed wireless access and a little bit of capacity extension, whereas we see really the ultra low latency uh, augmented reality communication uh, much later because the technology is not yet ready to support all of this. Huge market for this. So this means when you are a student, you probably should do research in this field because you will find employment in the future in this domain. Next slide, please. So very often when we talk about um, 5G, we talk about a network for cars, a, a customized network for different applications. So one network which should fit all requirements, being it in e-health, being it in entertainment and gaming, being it in the automotive and logistics field, being it in the manufacturing field, being it in controlling energy networks, uh, supporting safety applications and so on. So there's a huge variety of applications, which obviously, because these are critical applications, they need their own kind of network infrastructure. 
top secure, top reliable and available. Um, this is the key requirement. And 5G should support all this. So here are some early reports which are still valid as um, the drivers for this technology. Next slide, please. Okay, this is just another slide we can jump over. It just shows different sectors in the industry with different market sizes. So you see, and maybe only one point mentioned here, industrial automation is currently a key driver and we come to this a little bit later, so smart factories. Next slide, please. So, okay, let's look deeper a little bit into what 5G is and um, what we talk about uh, in this kind of technology. So now you need a quick finger, Amrish. Okay, so these are, as, as mentioned, we have these different application domains, being it e-health, automotive, manufacturing, safety, multimedia, blah, blah, blah. So the idea is um, that we look at the key capabilities of these application domains and we try to identify these key capabilities. And in the end, ITUT has identified massive multimedia capabilities, so big data transport. On the other hand, a high number of devices which are very stupid, low energy, and just produce a little bit of bytes, but um, it's the high number of devices in a very small area to be connected. So this is the massive IoT domain. And then we have the probably most challenging um, uh, part of this ITU triangle in the right bottom. It is low latency and ultra reliability. So here we need uh, one millisecond of delay in order to control robots. And uh, very often we also have high data volumes and high secure environments. So this is basically, this is what 5G should deliver. Next slide. And you can see these requirements are very, very different. So um, in principle, when we look at the whole network architecture, we can say, what are the key changes to the existing 4G network infrastructure? First of all, it is softwareization. And basically it's cloud-based servers, edge computing is popping up here. So we bring more control to distributed uh, data centers in order to be closer to the point where the control of the network and the interpretation and um, analysis of the data is happening in order to not move too much data back and forth. On the other hand, we need to support many different access network technologies um, in order to back, be backward compatible, but also exploit the new radio interfaces for 5G with the high bandwidth um, and lower uh, delay. And last but not least, we have also completely new kinds of devices because here we don't talk that much about a smartphone. We talk about connected devices. So we need here some, a car, could be a connected device, an unmanned vehicle, a drone, or whatever is around us, a robot in the factory or in the street. Um, so this is the dynamic programming of this environment becomes quite important. And we see virtualization and customization capabilities in all of those domains. So in the end, we see an end-to-end -end virtualized environment. And let me just stress here that um, this kind of network softwareization driven by network virtualization is already since 10 years underway. And in this context, we um, see progress, but we see also that it is not yet a really open ecosystem as has been proposed by the network operators 10 years ago. Nevertheless, we are currently moving to this red arrow on top of the antenna systems because this is open run principle. So here the idea is even to make these antenna systems highly programmable and customized in order to support different capabilities, but also having um, the use of uh, classic infrastructure. Uh, so from the shelf software, uh, hardware platforms, which is tricky in terms of low energy footprint and high performance. But these are challenges which are ahead of us for the next five years, I guess. Next slide, please. 
So network slicing. So this means the idea is that in the end, based on top of this virtualized network infrastructure, we will see customized configurations in order to have an IoT network, to have a multimedia network, to have a campus network. So thanks to virtualization, we should be able in a 5G environment to provide virtualized networks. In fact, you can call it a VPN type of infrastructure, um, but it is much more. And the tricky part is that there is also quite a lot of standardization happening. We don't see it yet really in the field. Nevertheless, 5G is just in the starting. But this is the concept. An automotive company, Bosch or Siemens or some energy company could rent their own network infrastructure from the network operator on top of a commonly shared data center infrastructure. Next slide. So standardization is going on as usual in 3GPP and in ITUT and lots of others um, in this context. The challenge here is we have a lot of domain specific standard bodies from the automotive domain, from the manufacturing domain, from the energy domain, which here of course need to get in touch with 3GPP, which has basically the control of the um, telecommunication standards. And this means standardization is complex and expensive. And uh, of course you find a lot of compromises which need to be done in order to make all these stakeholders happy. Let's move on to the next slide showing the standardization drama, I would call it. So here you can see that um, 5G standardization started with um, 3GPP release 15. So this typically means you create a standard which takes probably some three years, two years, depends on the first standard probably takes a little bit longer. But nowadays, every two years we get a new release. This whole process is slowed down due to COVID. Nevertheless, release 15 has been finished before COVID. Uh, release 16, um, so release fi uh, 15 is just for multimedia. So capacity extension, that's it. Release 16 is already enhancements for low latency and so on, but it's far away from really supporting low latency communications. Release 16 has been really hit by uh, COVID and release 17 is a standard which probably is providing a lot of add-ons in order to fulfill a lot of the requirements, particularly the IoT integration, um, narrowband IoT integration and so on into 5G, but also smart factory support. So you see that typically products based on these standards are happening a few years later. So this is where we have a, a postponement of standardization and what we see in the fields available in the, as products. And this is where we currently suffer also when building up test beds. The terminals, which you currently can buy, so the smartphones, they just support release 15, very seldom the release 16. And this means it is really uh, yeah, um, a lot of frustration when you as a customer hear about, hey, 5G can do low latency and all this data. You don't have it in your hand today. It will take a few years when you have a smile on your face, say, hey, this is really cool. So this is something which is very important to understand when you do research on top of this kind of infrastructure. Next slide, please. So I probably skipped this slide. It just shows the different phases of standardization. Next slide, please. Okay, so this means release 15, just multimedia, release 16 and 17, go into IoT and low latency extensions. Next slide. Frequencies. So this is something which is very important to understand also, because currently there are lots of discussions about 5G. And is it more radiation and electromagnetic footprints and so on? And people are currently uh, destroying 5G antennas. It's really a lot of, even some people think COVID is based on 5G. Um, so strange things happening. What is the key message? 5G in principle, um, could operate in any frequency. However, in these days, we have three main frequencies. So one is the capacity frequency, probably in the three point something gigahertz. So let's call it sub six gigahertz, um, because here you have a good compromise between cell size, which is smaller as an 
4G cell size, but you have high capacity in a quite large area. You have also some bandwidth available um, in the 700 and below one uh, gigahertz spectrum. Um, so we call these the capacity frequencies in the sense of you can not, it's not, it's not the right word. Um, basically you have cell sizes up to five to 10 kilometers. Obviously you can't transport too much high speed data on top of this because we all know that in an antenna area, the maximum bandwidth available has to be shared by all the customers, uh, active customers in this cell. So this means we can provide IoT applications in this context, but not super duper multimedia applications. So this is more for rural areas. And last but not least, we have the millimeter wave. So 26, 28 and higher gigahertz. Here, the cell size is just a few meters. So 10 to 50 max um, in order to provide high capacity uh, data transport. And this means you need lots of antenna systems in this area. And this is very often just used in-house in order to create smart campus infrastructures, for instance. There is frequencies in between. So a lot of network operators currently are reusing 3G frequencies for 5G. A lot of the, of the 4G frequencies are now also reused for 5G. And um, this is something to, to understand. Nevertheless, the key point is high capacity means a high number of antenna systems. And this means we have to build up a lot of more antenna systems, lots of costs, which of course makes it quite slow to deploy 5G. Next slide, please. So Amish, I think you now have to be very fast in typing because it's an animated slide, sorry for this. So just put the whole thing down. Okay, just this slide is just to illustrate that there has been a lot of research happening in the core network. So we have seen the split of control and switching. So SDN, we have seen a modularization of the functionalities. We have seen the introduction of service buses. We have seen the introduction. So it's all about 4G evolution. We have seen different access network support. We have seen the notion of edge computing and we have seen the notion of capability exposure APIs to create customized networks. So this is basically what has happened in my own research in the last 10 years. So it was crazy moving on to apply programmability to this kind of infrastructure. Next slide. So in the end, we see now in 5G two principal architectures. One, we can say the left-hand side is the classic 4G architecture, which is evolving. So sometimes the components are renamed. So it's a very static architecture because you have fixed connectivity between the different functional boxes, being it access management, session management, user data management, authentication function, and so on and so on. We have the split between control plane and data plane in order to, of course, take advantage of the software-defined networking principle. However, this is the old architecture. The new is the service-based architecture. And the service-based architecture is basically making use of um, internet principles, HTTP2 communication. We have basically a bus kind of architecture where we just add these components which could then dynamically talk to each other, which also means we can dynamically add functionality or drop functionality as we need it in this kind of architecture, which really allows us to create a highly programmable network environment. So we have to understand there's a big change in the core network architecture in the future. Full stop. Next slide. And then we have something, don't confuse with service-based architecture. So this is the way you have to go, first of all. And then we have something which is called standalone and non-standalone. So network operators who are currently rolling out the 5G network infrastructure are focusing on reusing LTE infrastructures. So this means they connect the old network to the new 5G network infrastructure and run the 5G new radio system in parallel. So because of the fact that you still have to support the old network, the non-standalone 5G architecture, you are somehow inefficient 
And this also is that the end systems, of course, need to support all of these other technologies because they um, somehow are not in a 5G cell coverage. They need to support LTE in order to be connected. So, of course, this costs energy and bandwidth or, let's say, performance, and it makes the whole system not that clean. In contrast to this, we talk about the standalone architecture. We assume that there is only a 5G architecture and a new radio environment, and we only use the new principles. And here we can go for real low latency and reliability. So this is something, the standalone architecture is coming with release 16 and is extended in release 70. So this means the products you currently can buy are mainly non-standalone. So this is also important to understand when you have a handset in your hand, in your, in your hand, that for instance, the new Samsungs and the new iPhones, they don't support standalone at this point in time. They are always compromised network technologies. The next year, you can get you can get some of those. No, you can move on. So you can get some of these handsets and radio systems in a standalone fashion. We have them at Focus. So some network operators like Huawei, Nokia, Amari Soft are supporting already standalone, but the terminal side is still very, very uh, tricky. So then we have edge computing, and let me uh, next this. You have to punch four times uh, because there are four parts of this slide. So. Edge computing is quite important as a principle in 5G because the idea is you can now bring intelligence and customize networks to specific locations because the assumption is that your local communication is important because you want to keep the communication local. Sometimes you need a backend infrastructure. So big companies who have different local sites may need some interconnectivity. Sometimes you need connectivity when you are outside this local environment for logistics, for instance, or general services. But it's very important to understand that you can play with this kind of architectural model because when you are on a drilling platform and you need connectivity in order to support all the local steering and control of these machines, you don't need any kind of backend connectivity to someone else. Yeah? Of course, you need to talk to some family members and so on, then you need a backend or you want to be some control and monitoring to a backend system, then you need this as well. But there are lots of use cases where this local communication is quite important and even more important than anything else. Next slide. So the 5G architecture, and this is, I don't have the time to go in details. We have done a lot of research how to configure network components into different edge side and central side environments in order to provide maximum autonomy that the local communication is supported, even in case there is not a backend system available. Next slide. So I think we now move to this private part and we have to be a little bit faster, Amrish, otherwise I'm running completely out of time. So in principle, we have, you have heard about, we can get a customized network by renting this from a network operator. This is called the network slicing approach. The other approach is let's build up a private network. You don't need a network operator for this. You buy your equipment from Nokia Ericsson and so on, or you buy it from even new small to medium enterprises currently popping up. And um, the question is, are you able to run it with your own staff or do you need some integrator, some company who is running this network for you? This is the big question. <coughs> Next slide, please. <coughs> so there's a huge market. We skipped this slide. There's lots of pointers to the relevant market studies. It's a huge business in the future. Um, therefore, also network operators are, of course, interested in looking at this market segment because this is not mainstream. This is highly customized networking environments which need specific skills in specific areas because we need to interconnect different um, machineries, being it machines in a factory, being it cars, being it drones, being it whatever you need to control robots for smart home or whatever kind of uh, support services. Next slide, please. Okay, we don't go for this. It's just, again, there's lots of money in 5G. Please, one more. So um, the challenge, or let's say key drivers for private network, you only need to cover one square kilometer, maybe five square kilometers. So this means you need a limited amount of antenna systems. You don't need to consider eventually backward compatibility. 
you can set up a vanilla standalone network architecture. You do it all 5G, you don't care for legacy, and you need specific features which are highly customized. This is a challenge. Currently, neither Nokia, neither Ericsson, neither Huawei can deliver a small footprint core network. And this is a big drama at these days. This is why we are so important for the market in these days. We provide a very small core network, which is good enough to control a network, which has this five square kilometers and a few antenna systems, depending on what type of access frequencies you are using. The challenge is, of course, when you do this in the outskirts, in the rural areas, uh, you need some fiber for the back hall if you need a backend connection. On the other hand, you could not disturb your neighbor. If you do this in the city, then of course you need to see who is next to you in order to avoid disturbing other local networks with your own frequencies. Next slide, please. So in Germany, we are very lucky. We are somehow the pioneers for separating a specific frequency part in the vanilla uh, 5G frequencies, because this is you with one base station, basically you need uh, three sectors or better, you have three antennas uh, in the end to cover one square kilometer or two um, or maybe five. Um, this is the frequency to go for high bandwidth, low latency is supported. So this is cool. Network operators were not happy that one quarter of the overall frequencies have gone to this kind of uh, local players. And local players, next slide, please. No, I think I don't have the slide here. Um, go on for the next slide. So the money for such a test bed is very low. So typically um, for the frequency, it is in between 5,000 euro for 10 years up to 30,000 euros when you have a bigger area to be covered. So this is not high cost. The costs for building up a network in this area is probably in the range of 150 to 3 million, um, as 150,000 up to 3 million euros, um, depending on really the size and the number of antenna systems you have to provide. But this is manageable for bigger companies who probably make some money. So the key point is when you look at the different market segments, and um, where is the biggest money? Then this is just one example. There are many others who are currently saying the manufacturing domain is the key domain where most of the revenues for 5G deployment will happen because this is the um, domain where we really need all the capabilities 5G is promising, low latency communication, secure communication, uh, lots of devices being able to be connected, so this is also where we are um, moving. Next slide. And I want, when you are interested in this, as I mentioned, 3GPP is doing the main standard, but you need, of course, these are connectivity guys. What you need in the end, when you want to provide a 5G customization for the automation industry, you need the people from the automation. So there is 5G ASEA as a pre-standardization organization where the Siemens, Bosch, network operators, vendors, but all these manufacturing companies who are building the robots, ABB, KUKA, and all of those, they are sitting together. <coughs> and they, next slide, basically have produced a lot of white papers um, in the past two years. They are preparing joint contributions to 3GPP, and they have elaborated on this private network. They call it non-public networks in 3GPP and the different options you have. So whether you have really your own infrastructure or you may have an infrastructure provided by the network operator as a network slice for you, or maybe you have just your own radio, but the core network is hosted by the network operator. So here you find some interesting links to download these white papers, which are publicly available to understand the environment. Next slide, please. So a few words on the Open 5G uh, playground in order to understand what we are doing. Next, please. So in this context, you know what I'm saying? We need test beds in order to see how technology is working or what is not working 
in order to enhance this technology and finally see that your new concepts and your new implementations <coughs> of these concepts are really in the end providing the performance levels you are uh, envisaging. So we are doing it since many years. Please, next slide. So as said before, we started with voice over IP and UMTS, and then we moved on to 4G and we built the open EPC. We started with open source. In the end, we recognized there's more money in doing not open source. So we are licensing software. So open EPC, which is sold to a spin-off company. Now it is sold to a big US player. So our open 5G core, you can license as an enterprise, as a university. It is nothing for individual students. It's too expensive. <coughs> it's a complex software system in which we put uh, five years, probably 10 to 20 people working day by day on the software. So it's a huge complex software, which these days works with all the major base stations and backhaul systems which are currently available in the market. So this means what I just want to say, we are doing it since many years and we have created ecosystems around this, around the world with universities and operators. So what is a 5G? Next slide, please. So basically it's a software toolkit which is implementing all the main capabilities of this um, 5G architecture, standalone architecture. We can integrate with 4G, 5G, wide Wi-Fi uh, network infrastructures. We can integrate with uh, satellite backhaul systems, with optical fiber, with whatever is available as backhaul. In fact, this is still a very old slide. We are now moving to release six um, in the current um, release uh, up to beginning of next year. Next slide. So if you would visit Focus, you see this demo wall. So all these components are put on mini computers, mini data centers. So you can really set up a huge network environment if you have the corresponding network infrastructure. But you can also bring the Open 5G core on one single um, data blade um, in order to have a small footprint. We even managed to bring a subset on an um, um, Arduino board in order to um, make some to an antenna mounted um, uh, system. Next slide. Of course, highly stripped in functionality. So the Open 5G playground is a reference test bed. <coughs> so in Berlin, we have uh, different um, laboratories. We are working in health, in automation, in safety, and in automotive domains. And so we are providing, particularly making use of this frequency ranges I mentioned before, 3.7 private 5G capacity band, but also 28 gigahertz or 26 um, for the um, small cell environment. We have this at focus. Next slide. So in principle, you see here some use cases. So we are doing it for self-driving cars in the garage. We um, have uh, some um, remote control of robots in our smart factory laboratory. And uh, we have also, I show you on the next slides. So the, there was a huge ramp up this year in COVID times to deploy this new standalone radio technology. And what we have in our labs is Huawei and Nokia. We are also having remote labs with TNO, for instance, where we are playing with Ericsson and other vendors. Ah, we also have Amarisoft, but we are using it indoor. So next slide, please. And just to give you an idea what we are doing, we are currently supporting lots of the European 5GPP uh, testbed projects. So currently there's a lot of um, evaluation how the technology could be used in different use cases. Next slide, please. So this means we are supporting quite a lot of test beds around Europe, and we are working very strongly with the European Space Agency, where you see here also the satellite backhaul, which is used for some applications um, where we could bring 5G in rural areas. Next slide, please. So some examples what we currently do. So we have, for instance, Media Broadcast, which is a company which is in the uh, building up a campus networks to exploring 5G applications west of Berlin. And they are using our 5G core and we are integrating this with uh, Huawei equipment to provide the coverage indoor and outdoor in this area. Next slide. 
So this is a smart factory network in Berlin where we connect different Fraunhofer institutes via optical fiber and doing edge computing based control of the machine park at uh, Fraunhofer EPK where they have a real huge manufacturing hall. Next slide, please. Next one, this is just details about this. So we are integrating basically with time sensitive networks. And we have shown demos of this already at Hannover Fair where we have controlled um, robots from remote via AR and um, um, time sensitive networks. Next slide, please. As mentioned before, we are working with the European Space Agency <coughs> and we can provide based in this car from Bundeswehr University, there is a local 5G cell which is connected to a satellite system. So this means we can bring this car at any place in an area and we can have there a local 5G network which could connect different people who need to be connected or different devices. And basically this project inspired another project. Next slide, please. What we are now doing, we just won a huge project where we are connecting and basically around Berlin, there's no 5G. Yeah? So we are in rural areas and we have lots of wildfires in this area and this area is mined. So the problem here is you can't send firefighters into this area because first of all, they can't really communicate with the backend infrastructure. So what you need in this area is um, remote Robots, you see this small little red thing in the lower part of this uh, slide. This is connected via 5G from a local control center and you have drones which take pictures of the area in order to guide the uh, command center uh, how to control these robots to extinguish the fire. So, and we do this at an airport in Schönhagen in Trebin. So this is a city, a small city um, uh, east of Berlin, rural area and no public 5G capabilities. So we built a local 5G network, basically two nomadic nodes, one in the airport and one mounted to a fire um, uh, control center in order to bring the 5G network to the place where the fire is happening. So just to give you an idea, what we are currently doing with our technology challenge, of course, is how does the radio behave in a fire and steam situation? How does this all integrate with these robots? We even mount by a drone um, an antenna system because, you know, we, we don't have any capability to build up this antenna somewhere. So it's much better to have a drone which pulls up this to 50 meters, 40 meters altitude in order to provide some coverage into this area. So next slide. So we are doing this all around the world. So we have currently 80 major customers like Deutsche Telekom or like um, manufacturing companies, but we are doing lots in Japan, in Asia and also in the US. Next slide, one more. So my final words, I'm sorry for being a little bit long, but um, where is this whole thing leading us? Um, I mentioned to you that I'm very happy to see that now 6G is around the corner. In principle, 6G is an evolution of 5G. And the question is, should we call it 6G or is it just 5G evolution? From a political point of view, it is called 6G because new research budget is made available for a new research topic. So we have to name it 6G. What are the drivers? The drivers are currently political driven. We want independent technology developments and we want to have this on a new radio technology. So 6G is probably terahertz communication or sub terahertz. So here we talk about 300 gigahertz, small cells. And this kind of frequency provides capabilities for specific location of the receiving and sending site, which could be used to control the beam forming in order to get a high bandwidth, which is really in the hundreds of gigabit per second. We have even, this frequency is kind of radar system. So this means we can even see what are movements of a person, for instance, an elderly person, which needs some supervision and support. So 
This means we are going for extreme reality, hollow deck applications on the one hand. On the other hand, of course, we have um, use cases which are in the construction and manufacturing area. We will have much more artificial intelligence, which is building this evolving adaptable network infrastructure um, and makes the deployment of these networks much, much easier in the future. We see open run as a way to program also the radio network. We see particularly that functions from the core move closer to the run. We see particularly the integration of non-terrestrial networks. You know, Elon Musk and all the other guys are setting up satellites, um, Facebook, hubs, you know, high altitude platforms, uh, even low earth orbits, which are moving around, which means you are in a cell, which you get from a satellite, but the satellite is moving. So you're standing still, but you need handovers because the new satellite is coming in. So these are topics which go into this kind of um, 5G evolution. And 6G is something we probably see in the market in 2030. So it's still a long way. The basic foundation starts now. I think I'm done. Um, we don't go for the final slide. Um, uh, Amrish, I have eaten up my time and um, I hope that you have seen that um, you can build up a local test bed. There is even, you know, buying open 5G core is 75,000 euro. It's a lot of money, but you get the source code to customize for your own research in your own premises. It's not a commercial thing, <clears throat> so you can't commercialize it. But it helps you because you can't buy this kind of software from Nokia, Ericsson, Huawei, and others. Yeah? On the other hand, you have now some open source 5G cores popping up. We don't know yet the real quality of these environments. Yeah? So, the core network is becoming fundamental in the future to be customized for different application domains. Local networks will pop up everywhere. It's not only Germany, we see it in the UK, in the US, in Japan and other countries now. Um, so this means my assumption is that 6G particularly is not anymore network technology for network operators, but for enterprises and for the general public. And we as researchers around the world we should have to play with it. So we are helping people to set up test beds in Germany, in Europe, in Africa, everywhere. So if you're interested in this kind of research, let me know. I'm more than happy to travel again when COVID is over. But nevertheless, even today, we are building up test beds and we are do this by teaching via Zoom and go to meeting and so on. So that's it from my side. I hope you have learned a little bit. <laughs>